um, this is chapter uh, 19 okay so this is uh, okay this in this uh, chapter the the main things that we uh, are going to see are two methods for evaluating whether predictions should be reported to the consumer um, of models and uh, we use these two packages applicable and probably i do the first part equivocal zones and it does the the second part applicability applicability so the first part deals with um, identifying the equivocal zones within our data and uh, so we deal with outcomes and predictions and see how to uh, better identify them and the purpose is to basically uh, get rid of them so eliminate them from the data and see uh, identify what are the data that are the best uh, for our predictions so for um, this example because we are treating we are uh, going through an example we use um, um, randomized data and this data set um, is built with um, is built of coordinate x and y um, for a randomized binomial distribution with a built-in um, class variable depending on a logistic function uh, which is the argument link um, logistic log it. So this is the binomial formula and um, what uh, we... Sorry to interrupt yeah. but uh, you are echoing a bit. Is that possible that you are logged in twice and that's the cause of the echo or... So. What about now? Uh, the same? Andrea says that he didn't hear it, so it's maybe not. not Is that? Uh, I don't know. It's good now. Yeah, it's it's good now. Thanks. It's it's good. Yeah. Just just tell me because I in in case leave the other uh, the other account. Okay. So this uh, uh, is the, the function for the logistic, for uh, the logistic function for calculating the, uh, the odds. So the, um, you, the, the, thing, the, the formula that is used in the, um, in the book. And uh, this is basically the logistic function, the link log it. Uh, to use and it's made of two predictors uh, that follow a bivariate normal distribution with 70% of co correlation and then uh, so this is a, a spec of the bivariate normal distribution and with all uh, its parameters so the sigma uh, the exponentiation of the standardization and everything so why I'm saying this? Just to visualize what what's happened um, when we make this uh, our data. Uh, the um, has been made a function to simulate this uh, um, the data that we are going to use for identify um, the 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 data and see how the, the how are the, the prediction how they perform so i spent some time uh, going through this function because um, um it's very interesting to see how to it's not just uh, taking our norm uh, with um, 
a mean and uh, standard deviation uh, and just use that. It's a bit more articulate and it's very interesting because um, this function uh, includes three um, arguments, three arguments which are the parameter n, then the error and the equation which is the, the, the formula, the logistic formula that we have just shown up above. Um, then the first thing that we do inside the function is uh, calculating the sigma. To, um, as we have a double um, uh, uh, values for this uh, uh, data set, we need a matrix uh, of values and we consider um, a matrix made of the 70% um, and 100% made of two rows and two columns. Then we, uh, we uh, I'll show you uh, more in depth what, uh, what I'm talking about. Then we starting setting up our data um, replicating a multivariate uh, um, random normal distribution with the mean zero and the sigma, the sigma that we just uh, have settled. Then, uh, okay, this is just uh, tidying things, like, but very important because if you don't name the columns, they may be a little difficult. And then uh, uh, we start building our class um, vector made of two levels. Um, then we go a little forward to see, then we go back there to see uh, an example. So we do n, uh, the error, the equation, and then building our sigma, which is a matrix like this. Uh, the equation is made with this function quote. This function quote doesn't do much, but assure you that all the things inside the, the, the function will be used like that. So basically it's simple, returns its argument. Then we use this function, which is multivariate random normal, and it produces one or more samples from the specified multivariate normal distribution. And this is from the mass package. And uh, user, the, the arguments that comes with uh, standard, as a standard options are n equals to 1, the mean, the standard deviation, so the sigma, the toll, uh, tolerance, uh, value, uh, if is empirical or not, and then this aging spec value uh, falls or, or not. So what we do is, uh, as I've shown, is setting up our multivariate random normal, um, and this is the output. So this is just the head, we have x and y, and we already have built our uh, coordinates. So what do we need is to build, uh, to add some noise to this, um, to the probability. And for doing this, we start creating um, an, um, one more column. That just to let, let's be clear that we, uh, the data set is very important. So this data set has been made for identifying the, uh, the value in a way that they are around uh, a normal distribution okay, of the uh, residuals. So we, and we want to, uh, the residual of the prediction. So we want to see if effectively this value that we found around this uh, this age, this border, um, are equivocal or not. And we see this um, 
uh, and we see if there is any echo please let me know uh, and we see this uh, mm, setting up a proper um, data set so going back uh, to what where we were so we have uh, um, the coordinate x and y to build uh, the data set around that peak and then we have uh, uh, the we build on these two coordinates another um, variable which is linear pred so the linear predictions and we use uh, to do this we use this uh, uh, symbol this sign for the equation that means uh, uh, do the equation basically on the coordinates in fact what's happened is this so it, it does apply the formula on x and y and it pull out the value uh, so then we add some noise because otherwise they are just linear predictions no so we add some noise ju just adding some uh, random normal value around the standard deviation which is the error that we have settled above before okay now we have um, quite uh, we are quite ready with our uh, data the, the last thing with this very is the past very interesting is um, that we need uh, to make the inverse of the binomial okay to do this there are some uh, uh, information to do this you can just like settle uh, a binomial uh, distribution and then do, with the dollar sign um, use this uh, uh, link inv so it will uh, apply to the binomial the formulation to obtain the inverse of the binomial and this is what uh, the output of this uh, these things to to say that you are making the inverse of the logistic function uh, for the binomial in our case uh, another uh, chunk of the function is this so we said having having uh, done the the linear pred with the um, noise we now set the probability and the probability from the binomial from the inverse of the binomial apply to the linear pred this is a formula standard formula in statistics and so there's some uh, steps to follow uh, but with the computation um, procedure is quite um, easier and just quite understandable because you use the linear predictions with some noise and you put inside the inverse of the binomial okay to uh, and this releases a, a vector of probabilities just like this and they are between zero and one because they are probabilities so now what the function does is comparing these results to a, a uniform distribution with a, uh, is hypothesized the, that some of the uh, linear pred um, so uh, the probabilities uh, are not exactly between 0 and 1 okay they go outside this range so it says uh, I compare this with uh, a random uniform which I saw, I know that is uh, between zero and one, and so I, I uh, made finally the class uh, predictor, the class uh, um, uh, variable, with uh, uh, saying if else prob 
is greater than my uniform, random uniform distribution, then call it uh, class 1, otherwise class 2. Okay, then we wrap everything together. So our final of, uh, that data is made like this. You have the coordinate x, y, we have the linear pred, and then the binomial inverse of the linear pred, which are the probabilities, but they go outside the range. So the one that are inside the range are in class 1. The one that are outside the range are in class 2. Okay, so this is the function. Simulates two classes and we do sigma, the random norm, the multivariate norm, uh, the linear pred, the prob, and the class. And then we make the class as a factor with levels 1 and 2. Okay, then we select just these uh, three uh, variables. Okay, so this is our set ready and is made of X, Y and class. What do we do with this, uh, with this set? We uh, use this to uh, have a training and a testing set, one made of 200 uh, rows and one another made of 50 rows. So this way what we are going to do now is to uh, visualize this data okay then make a prediction and test it on the testing set basic uh, important part is to estimate a logistic regression model using bison method means uh, um, um, making a parsnip model object and then fitting it with uh, the class variable and uh, the prior uh, distributions with the identity matrix of the value of x squared and y squared. So uh, this is the it takes time uh, we should go more in deep if uh, let, let's give uh, this given okay we know about that we use the engine stun and then we fit our model our stun quindi by Bayesian model and everything with class and these two identity matrix of the squared of the coordinates of the two variables basically then we uh, on, uh, on the training set. What uh, is the output? The output is this. Uh, this is a characteristic of the stand model, which releases a median and a, a, a mad standard deviation. Okay, you can find more information about them uh, using these uh, two uh, queries print stung regression or prior summary stung regression. You see that uh, we have a, a stun general linear model, family binomial uh, logistic, the formula is the formula with 200 observation because we have used the training. Then we see that uh, I've checked the range of the values. Okay, and I see that they are minus two something plus 2.5 so to see it uh, we need more data okay so we build up a grid with more data and we have uh, um, a range of minus 4.5 to 4.5 for both x and y so we have a grid and we apply the grid to our data, to our model, in a way that uh, uh, testing the training set to a larger uh, set. So we have a training set, a two-class mod, and a data grid. Now 
what we do is apply the predict function. The predict function is applied, um, we know what uh, the function does, uh, the function has these arguments, so you can have uh, type prop or type pred int, and we use both uh, with the help of bind calls. So we do uh, predict our two class mod on the data grid type probability and then uh, bind the columns of this result with another predict function again with data uh, grid but type pred int okay um, we see the, the output is this okay we have pred class 1 pred class 2 pred lower pred upper of both classes then we have a form of variables which are uh, class 2 both classes standard error and the two coordinates I've checked it again the, the range and the range is still minus 4 plus 4 because we have used it data grid. Then uh, to see the visualization of this data we need to see it against our testing data. Okay, uh, so we are using data grid but data grid is applied to our two class mode and the two class mode uh, the two class mode is this so it has the, the model the engine and is fitted to our training set so we predict our uh, model with the training set on uh, our new uh, data grid and this is the output I've checked the, the range because it's still larger than what we the, the, our training set then finally to see the visualization um, it, it, make a G, it makes a ggplot of the coordinates x and y then a geom raster which is this uh, uh, orange bit yellow orange uh, orange thing here of the pred class 1 because we use just class 1 class 1 is the one uh, which is inside the boundaries between 0 and 1 Okay, these are some extra features like the type of the line and everything. Uh, sorry, this is uh, control. No, this is the geom raster on the probability class one, and uh, inherits the uh, from the the, the gg plot, the ascetic. Then uh, geom point are the points of of the testing set which are few compared to the training set and uh, he uses the, the shapes different shapes to identify which are in the class 1 and which are in the class 2 and then geom contour for the thing I've said before and is this the, this uh, dashed line here so as you see some values are inside and some other values are outside but uh, both of them so, both of some of them are uh, exactly on the dashed line which is the boundary that we have fixed it so the the, the question here is um, what's happened to this data if the predicts just li make little variation uh, the things that happen is that uh, this data 
can uh, uh, go a little further outside or a little further inside. So how do, how do we pre prevent this? How do we identify this issue? Because uh, mm, uh, uh, these issues. Okay, the issues is that uh, we should uh, basically identify this data and uh, just take them out okay so um, it would be fundamental to consider that the values on the boundaries are considered equivocal and uh, uh, set a band of uncertainty about 50 percent will be fine but this 50 percent will be fine but not very exact exact um, correct because it, it would be appropriate to add like um, a sort of cutoff which is a little greater and a little lower than this 50 percent so to identify this value eventually remove them we, we could base uh, on um, the width of the band around the cutoff Okay, so to do this we use uh, the reportable, uh, we estimate the reportable rate, okay, uh, the reportable rate is a function, uh, the first thing that is done to uh, calculate this rate, um, because the rate is the rate that gives us uh, um, the idea of what is to be uh, removed or not. So we first apply argument function uh, and uh, this is to um, make this, this um, the data set uh, with the model and the testing set it's, it's like binding the, the rows, but with a, a, model, uh, a model class uh, set, with a model, basically. So the object is a model. Uh, and then uh, with the probably package, you need to install this probably package um, that uh, allows you to identify the equivocal zones uh, you can use this function make to class spread and this function creates a factor like colon that has predicted classes with an equivocal zone so basically it um, is used to convert class probability estimates to class spread object with an optional uh, equivocal zone uh, as this uh, comes with uh, these um, uh, options and in our case what we do is setting the levels for the class variable so we have class 1 and class 2 and then under uh, this is the test spread and is the one this, that we have uh, uh, binded with the testing set so our model binding with the testing set is the test spread these are the testing data then we do uh, mutate for adding this variable this is a custom name pred with um, a, uh, with the with these values and now we use the function with pred class one the level and we set a buffer okay the buffer is the little thing that we add and subtract from from the 50 percent so it's like a band okay for uh, identify the equivocal values inside a range okay so 
Uh, the uh, classical, so we know about that, conf mat function from yardstick fun uh, package, uh, basically what does it is to convert the equivocal values to an A once identified, so that um, um, we, the, the model basically, when we make the calculation, they are not considered. Uh, so, in fact, we have equivocal values. These are the conformat applied to uh, the whole data without considering equivocal values. And then, again, applied to PRED with uh, equivocal Z uh, values, which is this. And you see that um, there were nine equivocal values and all the others uh, that will be uh, accepted uh, when apply confmat the confusion matrix function uh, you see that the, the values changes so they decrease of nine both cla uh, classes then uh, uh, you can have this option applying is equivocal i go a little forward i have other three minutes and see that uh, this uh, um, equivocal zone function te um, mm, tested um, so basically it does make one more uh, function to test on uh, different buffer uh, values okay and uh, here inside this function is applied the reportable rate fun uh, function from the probably package uh, and this is this this function um, uh, where is it okay uh, basically here is an example if i have uh, uh, a vector uh, from one to five and i assign uh, the first two of this vector um, to class spread, then using reportable rate on uh, on this uh, vector, I see that uh, the values are not uh, um, are not considered. So they are equivocal. We have two equivocals, and the other uh, three are uh, good ones, basically. So reportable rate basically establish the the rate of the equivocals. Mm, data uh, and then uh, if we set uh, uh, the buffer to 10 for example uh, we see that we have uh, uh, some the buffer is 10 basically here I've used the function on 10 and it, um, uh, we have two more visualizations uh, and uh, it applies this mapping function to uh, the buffer. I made a pivot longer in a way to have uh, um, accuracy and the buffer. Uh, it is people longer to have a column uh, with uh, statistics and um, re accuracy and reportable basically it's a column um, with names and then the buffer so plot this plotting these two value you see that uh, uh, there is a little improvement okay about 10 percent then uh, the last uh, you need to think about this you spend some time on it then the little bit uh, little uh, tank, uh, chunk here is that the test spread is uh, used to predict so we bend the columns with uh, again the predict function and the standard error true with pred int so that we obtain this thing with equivocal values and everything 
and uh, we use this to um, see again the cutoff uh, a bit larger so to identify the value which are good and the, the value that we do not take consideration of so now I have a look at, um, at the, uh, the chart if there's any um, and then uh, uh, I pass it to you in the meantime okay I stop sharing so the chat here is um, we have created a simulated set of values with random noise exactly so for a classification problem and then we are fitting a Bayesian model on data exactly so uh, the packages mentioned in the beginning of the Bison stuff there are two packages mentioned in the in the beginning of the notes um, so I will compute the equivocal zone so I think it's everything answered isn't it is there any other questions maybe or oh, I leave everything to to you, Dilko. Is there any questions? Yeah, do I understand correctly? So these this equivocal zone stuff is is only relevant in the case of classification models, right? So where you have like a class probability. So for like a general uh, regression model, you can apply it. Um, um, you can apply, you you can search for equivocal values both for uh, for regression model for for regression for classification. Yeah, okay, maybe yes. Yeah, so what was confusing to me is that in the first part of the chapter they mentioned that okay they will uh, show two methods, one which is based on uh the prediction value and the other which is based on the predictors but they also but they also the first method is shown on a classification model and the second method is shown on a regression model so it, it was exactly. hard to know that which is the so uh, for me if you for, mix that uh, those up yes you're right exactly uh, yes, um, at the end I've said that uh, um, you're right, so it, basically you, um, what you're searching for is uh, are those values that you can eventually eliminate to have a, a robust prediction um, uh, column, basically. So you are sure that uh, those values will be suitable even if things change slightly with so they they will be more robust with new data basically. and this this can be applied to both um, uh, so you you are going to the second method i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah which is yeah. very interesting so i've taken lots of time we may go a little over the hours <laughs> okay yeah okay so so what uh, Federica showed you was uh, to determine if you should uh, apply a model or report the results uh, based on the predictions. And this, uh, the second part of the chapter is based on the predictors. So it's basically in my, it's like you should measure the extrapolation, the amount of extrapolation, and if it's too big, then you should be suspicious. So, so let's go through the example. Uh, okay, so let's see this. Uh, so they use the a different data set. So this uh, Chicago data set is about how many people ride the, the metro, I think. Or, or some some trains and uh, they have uh, daily 
amount of people at different uh, stations and they predict on on some day on a new station i mean one of the stations uh, sorry yeah uh, Okay, so, so there are a lot of stations and basically the ridership from these stations are highly correlated, as you can imagine that on the weekends, people ride less on, on all of the lines and, and all of the stations and, and, on, and in, in rush hour, they are, they are all, uh, there are more people, so basically, uh, this this recipe what's what's important okay they normalize so that they can do uh, partially squares and the stations are just the stations in a in a list uh, and they they create uh, these these components so that they are uh, they are less correlated and they have a linear model. Yeah, so that's that's not the important part. Uh, okay, so we can see that on on the test set, which is I think in two thousand sixteen, and they have data from from previous previous two weeks maybe or something like that, it, it seems to be, be quite a good model. And what they demonstrated, okay, the pandemic came and no one could predict that based on, so if, if, you, if, you, if you apply the same model, uh, you will have a really bad, a bad, bad model. So, so how could we uh, know this beforehand? So, so the predicted values were not suspicious. So they were in the range as previously. Uh, so, so this this is basically how how can we how can we identify this did this problem and the idea is that okay so when the pandemic hit then then all the ridership data from the previous two weeks already will have really different values than than any of the values we've seen before so if it's much smaller than than the smallest values that we have seen before then it, it's, it should be suspicious that, that we shouldn't apply that model for the new data. Uh, so maybe you can say that, okay, in, in this case, it's, it's like, it's quite easy to, to identify, or you can say that, okay, just the values are 10% 10 10 of the previous or something like that. But uh, just try to imagine that uh, that this is like a more general method. So in my understanding, this, this method is, can be, method can be applied to any model with, with numeric predictors. So where you can do this principal component analysis or partial least squares. So the idea is that uh, if you do, uh, partial list squares, squares it's ba it basically helps you to, to measure distance and to say that a single data point is how, how far from, from the typical data point in your training set. So we have this, uh, this distribution for the training set and we can uh, 
measure the distances from the zero zero point and all data in the training set has some distance and it's it's normalized and we have like decorrelated so it's we can just use a distance measure and and we can measure the the distance in the, in the training set and the idea is that okay treat this as if it were normal obviously it's it's not like a normal distribution but you can calculate uh, the standard deviation and then see how many standard deviations a value is is from the center basically and then you can set a limit on that so so it's it's i think the the core of the idea is that based on your predictors which in this case would be uh i think ridership data in the previous two weeks which is already really uh, low so so probably all of them will be much lower than than the values that we've seen before the so this is quite extreme and we see that that our data point is is quite far from from this distribution uh so let's see a code. So this is the So this is the model with, with the partial least squares and and we see the distance in within the, the training set. And we can see uh, the, 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 the distances in the test set and they won't be that much much different. But if we see the distances in the in in, in the 2020 data, then then the, 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 then this would be much higher. So so basically, you you should be suspicious. Uh, So what are the functions from the applicable package that we yeah, use for? Uh, so I'm just, yeah, so what's the name of this? Ah, uh, echo. APDPCA. Okay. Applicability something. Uh, they don't really but the component that uh, for 90 percent um yeah sorry uh so so basically what they tell is that the previous method where the model itself tells you the standard error for the prediction will be too optimistic in a lot of the cases so for a linear model, it realizes that the predictors are further, but it won't realize that it's like like how much further it is. So it 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 will be too optimistic. Yeah, sorry. So let's go back to the code. Yeah. So I think this part is in in my eye. It's so you sh so 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 if you have some variables 
which uh, so like I, I'm in my understanding, this distance measure is more trustworthy if if you have like only the most important uh, PCA components. So, but maybe it's it's just for to be more effective. I, I'm not sure to be honest. So, so this uh, uh, threshold. Uh, says that give me that many principal component analysis components so that the 99% of the variability is captured. And this single function, I think, does uh, so it it feeds the it creates the components and then also calculates the distance distance from the center for each of the, the data points in, in the training set. Uh, so like we have a, a, a reference distribution. Yes, and then we can have percentiles for for the new data. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. I I also think that it's important that basically you can't go above one. So so if your data is like further from the center than than any of your previous data, then it won't matter whether it's uh, two times further or 10 times further or 100 times further because it's it's like already uh, further than, than 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 anything you've seen before you so you can't know anything about that uh, yeah i'm just uh, not seeing that Okay, where is the limit or how do you apply this? Okay, so we have a score function, but I'm 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 to be honest, I, I'm I'm missing some kind of function to okay, then select the values. Uh, below the 99% threshold or something like that. So, Feel free to jump in any of you if you have. The applicability domain. Yeah, so so I'm I'm actually not sure how to use this. They say that it can be used for binary data as well. Um, can, can you go back to what the PCA stat value is uh, when being compared to the Chicago data? Uh, you mean this one? Yeah. So it's just 14, so it's like almost 100. But, uh, but even a bit uh, um, 
slightly before when you uh, before then they applied the um, the function for this one you mean yeah yes yeah, so uh, because these are the these are the components so it takes consideration of the dis these are the distances or just the components because the distance is the other one distance i mean the the, the 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 distance is i think the from the center what is the that? distance from the center so so here you have a line to each of the training data points from the center so like at the end of each line is a training data point and this blue example is a testing set data point and this red is a 2020 example uh, i meant I, I wanted to to show you something can i can i just uh, sure. um I don't know where, if I can find it quickly, but uh, um, where is it here? I haven't read the uh, very, so just skim at this second part, but um, there is uh, some, uh, where is it? There is some, um, I've seen an interesting thing. They show you, um, the, the parts where X tend to, uh, Y, um, Maybe it's on uh... no, I don't find it. But anyway, um, basically, the, the things I want to say, and how do you understand that? Uh, uh, when you have two components, for example, you put it in uh, in um, uh, you make a plot and see that uh, uh, on the x-axis you have uh, the principal component one and on the y-axis you have uh, the principal component two and then mm, when you compare when you talk about this plot and you compare this plot you say uh, this value these two value you say that the component one goes uh, on uh, uh, horizontal uh, growing horizontally and the component two growing vertically okay so um, if you stop on a point uh, anywhere inside the graph uh, where you see that there are some point what will you say about that point you mean this point or yeah any point in within inside the graph this is a composition of component one because the coordinates are component one and component two so yes. what is so this my understanding value? is that you can measure the distance for for any point from the center and then see that how is that distance on on this distribution which is from the training set and and it if you if you compute the the like the geometric distance then it doesn't matter how many components you have uh is, is this your or i'm not sure i understand your question uh no mm, i mean uh this is the the distance uh, um, um and uh, this is the training set. 
Yeah, so the, 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 the distribution of the distances is based on the training set. Okay. So this green line is the same green line that is on the components uh, plot as well as the, the red one. So yeah, so, so the black lines and the gray distribution is based on the training set and the blue is an example of a test test data set and okay they say that it's 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 quite normal so the test data is still within the within the bounds of the training data that we have seen before mm -hmm. however we have the the red data point from 2020 and based on these uh, components it's well it's you have to determine whether it's like how significant it is but it's mm. it's it's further from the center than any data point that we've seen before mm -hmm. so, so we we exclude these values oh. yeah so what i'm missing from this chapter is yeah so so what do you do when you have these these percentiles so, so what's the next step? Uh, yeah, sorry. So I, I didn't have much, much time to prepare, which, which is, which can be seen. So sorry about that. No, which is fine for me. So just to have some questions. I don't know if someone else has a personal experience to share. So I like the basic idea behind it. That you can use the principal components to to like to like have a unified distance measure for for many type of training data. But other than that, I'm I'm not sure if if I would just use this blindly. Uh, Daniel uh, said some question. Ask it some questions. Do you want to say? Uh, yeah. So, in my understanding, you can just like take the Euclidean di distance. So, like you have this square and you can you have distance one in one component and distance one in another then it's square root of two but i might be wrong but that would be my my thinking is that you combine these mm -hmm. there's two questions but, in the chat yeah sorry uh so if you say stat values column one. So you mean these? Uh, sorry, could you? Uh, yeah, okay, score function call, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah okay so pca is that yeah so so the pca is that i think is a data frame with the distances for the training set so it's basically one row for each training data point and the distance from the center based on the calculated components so when you use this on a new data set then for each of the data points in the data set the score function calculates the distance percentile based on the reference distribution so in my understanding the the pca stat is is contains this this uh, difference distribution uh, we don't see the the screen. Yeah, we yeah, see. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Why?
Yeah, so in my understanding, yeah, so it, it's again, it's like a, a complex data object, which seems to have a data frame in, in this percentile part of it. And it has the distances for all the components, and then it is combined. I think with, with this, this Euclidean distance measure. So, okay, is, is that better or? <laughs> Okay, okay, then uh, I think that's it for now.